Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist T.J. Malkanji. How to develop real faith in God. Today, we're going to focus on how you can take practical steps in growing your faith. Faith is like a muscle. And just like you can sit on your chair and wish you became bulked up and jacked up like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something in his prime, it ain't going to do you any good. It's all just wishful thinking until you take actionable steps towards the development of those muscles. There's many people who wish they can have more faith, and that may be you. You might be here listening to me, and you've said things like, man, I wish I could believe like that person. I wish I had faith like that person. Well, the good news is your wish can come true. You don't have to have a wish for it. You can actually do certain things that will contribute to the development of strong faith. People that are giants of faith in the Christian world and in history, guys like Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake or men like John Wesley, and you can go down the line, those great men of faith did not just stumble on faith. They didn't just wake up one morning and all of a sudden there was a lightning bolt that was surging faith right through them. And they said, man, I believe where there was doubt, now there's faith. Faith does not come by wishful thinking. Faith does not come by simply just being in church over a lot a, a span of time. Although being in church and hearing the word is a way to grow your faith, simply attending a church or calling yourself a Christian does not grow your faith. It's not that, you know, I know people who have been Christians for 50 years who have the level of faith of an infant Christian to this day. There's, there's people that I know who've been Christians for many years. There are even preachers that don't carry the level of faith of someone who might have been saved five years ago simply because the person who got fa- saved five years ago, they have learned the strategies in developing the faith and they've applied it and they've grown their faith and the one who's been saved for 50 years has just sat on the initial level of faith that they received at salvation and so I don't want that to be you I want you to be a person who you know as Christians we're to be people who should be uh, not lazy but actively engaged not only in developing our faith, but in soul winning and, in, and in, in, in church activity. Christians should not be stagnant, fruitless people. Jesus said in John 15, verse 16, he said, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you should go out and bear much fruit. We should be fruitful. Everything about our lives should be fruitful, should be multiplying, should be growing. Everything that pertains to me should be on an upward and forward trajectory. Nothing that pertains to me, my faith, my peace, my my peace, my joy, my love for others, it should constantly be abounding and increasing. Finances, everything in life should be on an upward and forward trajectory. Matter of fact, Paul commends the Thessalonians church in second Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 3 he says and I give thanks to God for you Thessalonians as it is fitting because your faith groweth exceedingly the Thessalonian church their faith was growing exceedingly their faith was increasing not just normally exceedingly they were they were aggressively engaged and what I'm about to talk talk to you about today in the strategies to developing strong faith they were aggressively engaged in these strategies that led to their faith their faith to be exceedingly growing. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that excites me. I don't want to have stale faith. I've met many Christians who have stale faith, and we're going to get into the different types of faith that the Bible lists, especially and particularly in the New Testament, but there is something called dead faith. James 2 says that faith without works is dead. There are people who have dead 
faith. They once had living faith for it to be dead. For something to die, it has to have been alive. There are people who had living faith. They had vibrant faith. They had uh, active faith that has grown dull, dim, and dead eventually. And you can see it. It's visible even on their visage, their faces. When you have dead faith, your face doesn't even look the same. Your faith, you, you have like a, a sad countenance. When your faith is alive and well, when it is vibrating through you, through your bones, there's literally a physical disposition that you carry when you have living faith. The, you know, I, I've heard this oftentimes uh, from a great evangelist friend I have whose name is Jonathan Shuttlesworth. And he says, some Christians look like they're the third guy from the left on the evolution chart. Their backs all hunched over. They look grumpy. They look sad. They look groggy. And you ask them, how you feeling, Brother Stewart? And they say, blessed. They're not blessed. Their faith died in 1978. They're not blessed. Just because you say blessed does not mean you're blessed. The blessing carries a tangible, physical evidence. When you carry living, active faith, it's going to show in your face. I'm telling you, faith people are happy people. Hallelujah. I'm going to repeat that. Faith people are happy people. I want you to write that in the comment section. Faith people are happy people. Faith people are happy people. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of peace fill you with all joy and peace as you believe. When you carry faith, there's joy and there's peace. It, I'm telling you, Charles Spurgeon used to say this. He said that just any scripture in the Bible, any scripture, take any scripture in the Bible, and if you exert enough faith in that scripture, it has the capacity to eradicate any type of depression, even the most vile form of it. Charles Spurgeon said, any scripture in the Bible, when believed upon, has the power and the capacity to eradicate even the most vile form of depression. If you find yourself depressed and anxious, it's time to take inventory because with faith, comes peace. With faith comes this level of serenity. It keeps you. There's this level of peace. There's this level of a, a worry-free life that surrounds you. When you are constantly finding yourself in a state of worry, take inventory as to what's in your heart. You remember in Mark chapter 4, the disciples panicked because the water was filling the boat and they began to say, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? What did Jesus reply? He said, First of all, he, he, he rebuked the storm and the winds and it became perfectly calm. Then he directed his words towards his disciples. He dealt with them and he said, why is it that you are so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? When you have no faith in your heart, you become a fearful person. We're going to get into that in the coming seconds. If you're just tuning in now on the broadcast, you do me a great help. If you like it on YouTube, share this broadcast, like this on Facebook, help us get this word out to more people. Okay, let's go through a little synopsis as to what we discussed yesterday. Faith is not is not wishful thinking. Faith is not hoping for something to happen. Faith is not crossing your, 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 your fingers and squinting your eyes and getting red in the face and shaking your head until something happens and saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's not faith. Someone who talks like that, they might look like they're super spiritual people, but there's actually zero spirituality about what they're doing. Faith is simply defined as an unshakable confidence and trust in the integrity and character of God. Faith, simply defined, is unshakable confidence and trust in the integrity and the character of God. Remember, I've said this before in speaking on faith. When you doubt God, God sees it as the greatest sin. Why? Because when you doubt God, you are challenging His very character and integrity. When you doubt God, when you say, God, I don't think you can do this. And some, nobody has the, the, the boldness to actually verbally confess, God, I don't believe you can do this. Most people will never say that. 
Some people in a state of panic might, but most people don't say that. But by their actions and by their daily confession, they prove that they don't believe God is able to do a certain thing. And when you doubt God, you're challenging his integrity. You're challenging his character. You're challenging the very essence of who he is. You're saying, God, I do not believe that you have integrity. I don't believe that you are a reliable nor a dependable person. You are prone to error. You are prone to mistakes. Mistakes, you are prone to failure and so this is why I cannot put trust in you it actually it insults God's very nature and who he is that's why he sees it as the most vile sin that anybody can ever perform in Hebrews it literally says they did not believe and God said I swore in my wrath they would never enter my rest unbelief is it actually steers up God's wrath it steers up God's wrath I know there's a lot of preachers in today's Christendom where they say things like, how many of you know doubt is just God calling you to a deeper relationship with him? That's not anywhere in the Bible. There's people who say, how many of you know we should explore our unbelief? Unbelief's not a bad thing. It reveals our humanity and blah, 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 blah. Garbage. First of all, the Bible never says we should explore. Neither should we reveal our humanity. The scripture says very clearly that we should crucify our humanity. We should put, to, put away from ourselves our humanity our carnal nature, our lustful flesh, and we should put on Jesus Christ. The Bible says, put off the old man. The old man who is the carnal man who's prone, susceptible to doubt, susceptible to unbelief, susceptible to every wicked thing. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, we should put off the old man, not entertain the old man, not explore the old man. You got to wonder what some of these preachers are smoking these days. When I'm not trying to explore my doubt, I'm crucifying my doubts. I must decrease. He must increase. I don't, you know, you have today a lot of faith people that are criticized by a lot of preachers. They say those are those hyper faith guys. Oh, we're not hyper faith. We're, we like to take a more realistic approach to God. Well, you've eliminated yourself from ever being used by God. I don't want a realistic approach to God. I want a Bible approach to God. I don't have, I don't get my percept, percept, perception or perspective rather, about who God is based on my own inner thoughts and um, contemplations. My perspective of God, who he is, how he operates, what he does, and what pleases him comes from the Bible. And as I said yesterday, it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So those people that criticize hyper faith people, oh, those are word of faith people. What do you want me to be? A word of doubt person? What do you want me to be? A word of unbelief person? Yeah, I'm word of faith. I'm word of hyper faith. I'm word of supernatural Superman hyper faith. I want all the faith I can get because without it, nobody can please God. But with faith, the Bible says there's nothing that is impossible to the man who believes. I want you to make that confession and type it out in the comment section. Write it out. Say, I'm hyper faith. I am hyper faith. I'm, I am hyper faith. I'm Superman faith. Hallelujah. Man, that got me excited. So faith is not, as many people say, reserved for the non-rational and the illogical people. Oh, those people, they need faith, but we have a more rational approach to life. All right, was Jesus not rational? Was Jesus illogical? Was Jesus an idiot? No, he wasn't. He was not and he is not. He's, he's the omniscient one. And yet Jesus, as an omniscient as he is, he said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you should have the faith of God. For if you say to this mountain, be thou uprooted and cast into the middle of the sea and do not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things which you say shall come to pass, you shall have what you say. You know, I was reading this yesterday and it, it's gonna enforce the point I'm trying to make right now. In Luke chapter 24, the very first time the disciples were actually had the opportunity to exercise Bible faith. Look at what happens. Luke chapter 24, and the Bible says, I believe it's in Luke chapter 24. It might be, yeah, right here. Luke chapter 24. And they remembered Jesus' words. Then they returned, which is Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of jo uh, James, and the other word 
uh, woman with them, they came and told these things. What was these things? That Jesus had risen from the dead. They told these things to the apostles. In verse 11, they have the opportunity now to actually exercise the faith, the faith of God. They have the opportunity to believe that which Jesus had been, already been telling them for months in advance, saying the Son of Man is about to be betrayed and thrown into the hands of sinners and he will be crucified, but on the third day he will rise again. This was no surprise to them, or at least it should not have been of surprise to them. Jesus had more than once warned the disciples throughout the Gospels, throughout his years of, of, of ministry with them, that he was going to one day be betrayed into the hands of sinners, crucified, and on the third day rise again. But listen to this. So now they have opportunity to actually remember that and say, wow, praise God, he's alive. And instead, the apostles hear it in verse 11, Luke chapter 24 and verse 11, the Bible says their words seem to them like idle tales, irrational, illogical, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping down. He saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. So they... They thought it was idle tales. They thought it was a fairy tale. Faith is no fairy tale. Faith is not a crutch for us to lean on just to help us get our mind off other things. Faith is not illogical, irrational conduct for human living. Faith is a living force that is drawn from the living word that produces living results. Faith is the living force that is drawn from the living word that produces living result. Faith is not the image of laziness. There's a lot of people who have a misconception of what faith is. They think faith is just relying on fairy tale dreams and hoping once upon, you know, like once upon a time uh, syndrome. Fairy tale living, where they're just hoping for something magical to happen. Faith is not Disney World. We're not hoping for something magical to happen as we just, you know, wishfully think about it or hopefully dream about it. Faith is a tangible substance. You can know that you have it and you can know when it is not there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for or desired. That means faith is substantial. It's something that can be held. It's something that can be touched. Let me read this. This scripture is popping up into my spirit and I know it's the Lord because I haven't read it in quite some time now. 1 John chapter 1, this is what the Bible says, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So the word of God, which we've discussed yesterday, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God is the custodian of faith. It's where faith comes. The word of God carries faith and you can make withdrawals from the word and put that same faith in your heart. But here what, here's what it says concerning the word of life. You can hear it. You can see it with their eyes, with your eyes. You can look on it. And then it says your hands can handle it. Our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So that shows you what's in this book can actually be handled. It can actually be felt. It can actually be substantial. It can actually be touched. Faith is not mystery. Faith is not mystical. Faith is not ethereal. Faith is substantial. Hallelujah. So, knowing these things, let's go through four steps to recognizing, sorry, to developing real faith in God. Four steps to developing real faith tangible Bible faith in God. Number one step to developing real faith is you must recognize that you already have a measure of faith. Romans chapter 12 and beginning with verse three, you have a measure of faith. For I say, Paul speaking, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, latter end of this verse says this, and highlight this in your Bible, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has dealt to each one. That includes you. He's talking to born again people. A measure of faith. You have a measure 
of faith. So stop saying, I don't have faith. If you say, I don't have faith, then you're going to hell. Because the Bible says it is by grace through faith that we are saved. So you can't even be saved without faith. So if you confess, I don't have faith, then you don't have the very thing that guarantees and secures your eternal security or your eternal destination, which is heaven. Hallelujah. So you have faith. So stop saying, I don't have faith. You just need to learn how to, A, add to that faith, which let me read this. This is in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. So you have a measure of faith, but if you stay at the initial faith of salvation your entire life, you'll be saved, but you might not be able to tap into everything that God has desired and designed for you to have in life and his voice to us through his word. Listen to this, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Add to your faith, add to your faith virtue. So you can add to your faith. You can add to your faith. Your faith, though there's an initial amount of it at salvation, and many people call it saving faith. Saving faith, which would be like the, 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 the soteriological term for it. Saving faith, the prevenient grace of God gives us saving faith at salvation. What's prevenient grace? So there's people, there's two types of doctrines concerning this. There's Calvinism, Arminianism. Calvinism is that God has chosen you before. The, there's nothing you can do to not be saved, you're going to get saved, you are a robot in his system, you will be saved, he's chosen, he's selected you. I don't believe that. I do, however, believe in the Arminianistic approach to it, which is prevenient grace. What is prevenient grace? God has given all of man a grace that they now have the capacity to believe God. Though we have utter depravity because of sin, God in his mercy and grace has given us prevenient grace. It precedes, it's before, that we now have the capacity to believe God, even in our depravity, God has given us at least this grace to believe him, and every human has it. And some choose to act on that and believe and receive Jesus Christ. Others reject the will of God, reject the grace of God, and the prevenient grace of God, and choose to live a life in rebellion and in the other direction. So we have this prevenient, this saving faith at salvation. However, I just proved that you can add to this faith. Faith is a gift from God. By it, you are saved. But through it, now that you've entered into salvation, you can add to that faith. And like I said before, there are people who are 30 years Christians and they still operate at that same level of saving faith. They haven't moved on to the different levels of, great, of faith, which I, I'm going to list out, which are great faith, the gift of faith, supernatural faith, and the different levels of faith that I'll, I'll list out. There's, when the Bible says in Romans 12, 3, that God has dealt to each man a measure of faith, he's talking about biblical faith or saving faith. He's not talking about uh, natural faith. I spoke about it yesterday, what natural faith is. You sit on a chair. You don't have to test the integrity of the chair. You just sit down. When you get on an airplane, you don't have to evaluate the pilot's mental wellness. You just get on and hope that he's mentally sane and is going to bring you there and not bring you into the Atlantic Ocean. When you order something off Amazon, you are expressing natural faith. You've, you've put in the order. You've given them your money. It says that the order is being processed. You don't call Amazon every single day and say, Amazon, where's my order? I ordered it 15 minutes ago. How come it's not here? You don't do that. Why? Because you trust the process of Amazon. You trust that they are a company that carries integrity, that since I've ordered something, they're going to send it my way. You trust that there's a level of natural faith that you've placed in Amazon, that you're not just sending the money in vain. There's going to be a package that comes to your door at some point in time. And you have this piece. You know, you even go out and tell everybody about what you ordered on Amazon. You, and you're, you have a sureness, an assurance to it. You have a certainty to your words. You have a confidence that Amazon is sending me my new flat screen TV. I 
ordered that new book. It's coming on Tuesday. I will share you what I, I will share with you what I learned from that book the moment I get it on Tuesday. You're happy about it. You're excited about it. But why is it we don't, if people have natural faith in that, why don't we have that type of faith in the word of God? Just like Amazon has a website that lists everything that they have to offer. The word of God is God's website that lists out everything he has to offer. Why is it that we order packages off Amazon and we have a, a, an assurance in our spirit that it's going to come on Tuesday, but then we order things out of the word of God and we have this uncertainty whether God's going to actually do it. Do you think Jeff Bezos is better than God? Do you think Jeff Bezos and the Amazon process is more efficient than God's process of answering prayers? Come on, people. No, the Lord is faithful. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. He said, what things ye desire when you ask in prayer, believe that you have received them. Not I'll believe it when I see it. Believe that you have received it and you shall have it. In essence, we use this when we got saved. If you're genuinely born again, when you got saved, you believed two things. That if you, Romans 10, 10, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, you are saved. You were foolish enough to believe that. Think of it. I mean, I, I always find it very humorous to me when I have Christians come to me and they say, I have a hard time believing God can do this. Because you're a Christian. You believe that 2,000 odd years ago, God raised a corpse up from the dead in a tomb near Jerusalem that you've never even visited, nor do you even, you've never even, you've never stepped on the ground of the garden, uh, where the garden tomb was. And you believe that a corpse 2,000 years ago, ago jerked back to life and is alive. And then not only there, he rose up, ascended to heaven, and there's this place called heaven, and he has sat down at the right hand of God the Father and is now Make an intercession for us according to the will of God. You have the ability to believe that. You have the ability to believe everything else the word of God promises. I'm sorry. If you have the ability, if you're crazy enough to believe that, be crazy enough that he can heal your body. Be crazy enough that he can prosper your bank account. Be crazy enough that he can deliver you from depression. Be crazy enough that he can restore your family. If you're insane enough to believe God for this, then believe him for the rest and quit worrying about it. So number one, steps to developing real faith. Recognize that you have an initial measure of faith and quit saying, I have no faith. Number two, recognize that while every Christian has a measure of faith, not every Christian is at the same level of faith. And that is very obvious by being a Christian for like three months, you'll know that. Not everyone is at the same level of faith. Now, understand this. It's not realistic to expect a three-year-old to drive a semi-truck. You just got saved. You have that measure of faith. You've been adding to it. The milk of the word's been growing you. It's not realistic to take a three-year-old or a two-year-old and have him on a, the semi-truck wheel and help, you know, expecting him to drive that thing from Boston to New York. It's very foolish to think that. Doesn't mean the three-year-old is inferior to an adult who can do those things, it simply means the boy is not mature enough to handle the task of maneuvering the vehicle yet. So when I talk about developing faith, oftentimes, unfortunately, pride rises up in a lot of people because they think I've got it all. Much pride rises up in people when discussing the subject of faith and how to develop faith because there's prideful people think that they don't need anything to be added to them. Prideful, you know, you tell someone that, you know, maybe you should strengthen your faith in that area. And they go, oh, you don't think I have any faith? You know, they, they get all puffed up. They, they go into defense mode. You don't think I have any faith? Proud people think they know everything there is to know about God. Oh, I know that's in the Bible. I don't need it. Whereas people that are humble, and I'm telling you, I've met giants of faith Giants of faith are humble. Giants of faith understand they don't know everything there is to know about God yet. And giants of faith realize they need to have a daily intake of the word of God to sustain and grow that faith. There's a lot of Christians that have read, the, they've read Mark eleven twenty three 23 once and they think that's all 
they need to know about faith. That's all they, know, they need to know about faith. It's like you go to school. You go to school. And you have in a classroom people that get 30% on a test, 60% on a test, 90% on a test, and those that ace the test 100%. It's not that the guy that got 30% on the test doesn't know anything about the subject matter. It's that he didn't know enough to actually pass the test. There's a lot of Christians who are proud because they know something about faith, but they don't know enough, and in their pride, they've entered into a place of stagnation and frustration. They're beating against the wall. They're very frustrated because they say, I can't believe I'm not moving forward in this. Why, oh God? They start to play the blame game. They blame God. They blame people. When in reality, because they say, God, I, I, you know, I, they, they, they claim to know something about his word, but they don't know enough to actually facilitate the breakthrough. And it's their pride that holds them back. They think they know enough. The guy at 30% thought he knew enough to get by on that test, but he didn't. The guy at 59% thought he knew enough to get by on that test, but he didn't. The guy is only those that, that actually studied and applied and grew their understanding that were able to pass the test. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8 two, the one who thinks he knows something he knows nothing at all as he ought to know. The one who thinks he knows something, he knows nothing at all as he ought to know it. You may know something about faith. You may have a level of faith, but do you want to stay at that level or do you want to grow into higher levels? Some prideful Christians are frustrated because they're attempting to believe God for things beyond their actual level of faith. And, I, and I, I've met people like this. They're asking for things that they, in their heart, know they don't believe God can do. They're asking for things that fall into the class of wishful thinking, and they think it's faith. Faith is not presumption. Faith is not assumption. Faith is not, like I said, a, a, a wishful thought, just throwing some up there, you know, like you throw past on the wall and hope it sticks. Faith is not throwing something up and hoping it sticks. Faith is built on actual knowledge of God's word. And there's some people who are asking for things beyond their actual knowledge of God, God's word. Faith is not just, God, I believe you can do anything, so I ask this. Faith is built upon the revelation of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. That first hearing is audibly receiving. And by hearing the word of God, that second hearing has to do with understanding. So faith doesn't just come by receiving God's word in your ears alone. It comes by understanding what you are hearing. Hallelujah. Faith cometh by hearing and understanding in your heart what you are, he what you are hearing. And so... Your faith cannot go beyond your actual understanding of what God's word. So faith is not just, God, I know you can do anything. Can you do this? Faith is, God, I see in your word by your covenant that these are things that you've promised. And I can list down three scriptures that promise me what I'm believing you for and I'm desiring to happen in my life. And so, God, I put you in remembrance of these things, and I fully expect and I'm fully persuaded that what you promised, you're able to perform. Hallelujah. That's what faith is. There's a lot of people that said, oh, man, I'm believing God for healing. Well, what scripture are you standing on? Oh, I just know God is a healer. Amen. Oh, he's a healer. He can do it all. Hallelujah. I mean, great. We agree. He is healer. But faith is not just believing God is healer. Faith is, faith is knowing. It's not just knowing the ability of God. It's knowing his will. There's a lot of people, even in the world, that know God can do anything. Like that leper that came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't doubt God's ability to make him clean. He just doubted God's willingness to do so. And it handicapped his faith. It restricted and limited his faith. I don't just believe God's able to heal. I believe God 
is willing to heal because the Bible says in Exodus 15, 26, he is the Lord, our healer. Exodus 23, 25, he'll bless my bread and water and take sickness out of my midst. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, by his stripes, I am healed. And then in the New Testament, he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. I have his will. His will is to heal all. I'm not just throwing something up. I'm not just believing God can do it and I'm just waiting for him to do it for me. I know God wills to get it done. Faith is so powerful that a Syrophoenician woman, get this in your spirit, a Greek woman who at that time, Jesus' ministry, remember he told the disciples, go not into the way of the Gentiles, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His mission was to the Jew first. Salvation is to the Jew first. Romans 1.16, the power of God unto the Jew first and then the Greek. Jesus' mission was to appear as Messiah to the Jew first. Afterwards, we see in Acts chapter 10 that the gospel is opened up to the Gentile. Peter has that revelation. Paul's called an apostle to the Gentiles, and we see that unfold. However, Jesus' mission was not to the Gentile. It was to the Jew. However, you have a Gentile woman who, even though it's not the right time for her to receive any benefit of heaven because the power of God, the blessing of God was to come to the Jew first because they were entrusted with the oracles of God, you have a Gentile woman saying, Lord... Eve, because she had a daughter who was demon-possessed, Jesus answered her not a word because it wasn't her time to receive the gospel blessing. Now, it is everyone's time to receive the gospel blessing. I've heard people use this and twist this. You see, sometimes God doesn't see it fit for you to be healed like that Gentile woman. No, it wasn't the time then because the gospel door hadn't been opened to the Gentile world, but now it is. And now anyone, everyone, it's it's, it's an, a universal invitation. All can come, believe, be saved, be healed. But at that time, it wasn't. It wasn't the time for the Gentile woman. And so Jesus answered not a word. And she began to plead even stronger. The disciples came to Jesus and said, can you send her away? They had no compassion. They had no heart. Jesus, can you send her away? She's irritating us. And Jesus said, little lady, it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the little dogs. You know what her reply was? yes. But even, even the dogs get to eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus stepped back and said, woman, your faith is great, but it's still not your time. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, kiddo. You're going to have to go home to your demonized daughter. No, woman, great is your faith. Let it be unto you as you have desired. Hallelujah. When your faith says yes, God will never say no. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So as I was saying before, there's people who are attempting to believe God for things beyond their actual knowledge of God. That woman, the South Phoenician woman, knew that she was healer, that, that Jesus was healer, and that she, her daughter can be healed. And so she acted on that knowledge. There's some people that are so proud, they're trying to prophesy a seven-tiered cake when they've never even prophesied a donut into existence. There are some people that are way ahead of their faith level. Be realistic with yourself. You know, when I set goals for the year, I could easily write down, I want to win 7.8 billion people to Jesus this year. I don't have the faith to believe for 7.8 billion people to come to Jesus in 2023. I just don't. Is it possible? Absolutely. Do I have the faith to do it? No. So I write down goals that reflect my level of faith. And I'm very honest with myself. I wrote down 10,000 souls this year. I cannot do that by myself, but I know with God's help, I believe, I know it. I have a knowing in my spirit that with God's help, we can attain that goal. Without God's help, I can't do 10,000. I can't even do 10. But with God's help, I believe I can hit 10,000 souls this year. So I wrote that down on my vision board for this year. When you are writing down objectives or vision, a vision board and goals or whatever, don't prophesy, be, prophesy or believe or, or expect things beyond your actual level of faith. Exam, the Bible says examine your faith. You know the Bible says that? Test your faith. Examine your faith. Examine yourself. Actually, in Romans 12, 3, it says don't be high-minded, but be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. What, what am I, I'm not saying what do I think I can accomplish this year. I'm saying, what do I believe at the level of faith I meant God can do this year? 
Because there's some people, I'm believing, I remember, and I, I'm not trying to throw my wife under the bus, but she'll laugh with me now because now, you know, we laugh about it. But I remember when we were in, we were living in a basement, my parents' house, we just got married. We, you know, we were virtually homeless. So whenever we were not traveling, we were just crashing in my parents' basement house because we didn't have money, doors open, we didn't have much money. And I remember uh, she had seen this house in Florida on uh, Craig's, uh, not Craigslist, what's that, like realtor.com. And it was humongous. I don't mean humongous like in comparison to the basement we were living in. I mean humongous like Jeff Bezos could live in that thing. It was insanely huge. I think it had like 21 rooms. It had a huge, huge, um, it was a mansion to say the least. It was a massive mansion. And I remember her reading Deuteronomy 6. You know, the Bible says you'll inhabit land that you didn't, uh, you didn't um, earn for yourself. You'll have houses full of furniture and good things that you didn't fill and all that. And the great promises. And I remember her. Why you got to do me dearly like that? I know. Well, Carrie, we're both, we're both in it together. We're both to blame. But I remember we, we set our faith for that house together. She had brought it up. Not trying to be Adam here. The, the woman made me do it, but she had brought it up. And I remember we set our faith for that. And uh, <laughs> I remember thinking, after we moved out into a condo and realized it ain't going to happen now. Not saying it will never happen. Maybe we were using that faith for a futuristic thing. Maybe in the future we'll have, I don't know. But I just remember later on thinking, if we had even had that house come into our hands, if the guy said, here are the keys... I couldn't even pay the bill for the electricity in that thing. I wouldn't even have been able to keep the lights on. First of all, first of all, the lights. Secondly, to mow that lawn, I would have had to have left the ministry just to mow the lawn because it was so large. It was not right for us. It was not the time for us. Uh, and neither, we hadn't even believed God for a condo yet. We were still in our basement. I'm trying to explain here. Before you believe God for a seven-tiered cake, believe him for a donut. If you're in a place where, you know, you, you don't have a job, it's nice and noble and fancy to believe God that you're going to be the CEO of Amazon like next week. Jeff Bezos is going to somehow miraculously step down and make you CEO. Can it happen? I'm sure it can happen. But you haven't even used the faith to get a job at McDonald's yet. So let's begin at step one, let's start with first things first. Amen? How do you know you have faith? How do you know you have faith? I wrote down five proof that faith is in your heart for that thing. How do I know I've come to a place where this is a God thing and I'm, I have the faith to believe this for? One, you have joy. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe. When you believe, when, you, when genuine Bible faith is in your heart, you're going to have joy. You're going to be happy. You're going to be, there's going to be an excitement to it. You're not going around, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen, but you know what? I've got my, I've got my hope up. No, you, you'll have excitement about it. You'll go and tell people about it. You're, you'll be happy. You're not going to be weighed. There's not going to be a weight on your shoulders and question marks in your mind whether it's going to happen. There's, there's a joy that comes with it. Number two, proof of faith's presence in your heart is there's a peace. Isaiah 28, 16. He that believes will not make haste. He won't be hasty. You're not going to be a nervous wreck like you're a, a guy who's smoking two packs a day. You're not going to be someone that looks like a, 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 a fiend on the side of the road scratching your arms. You're going to have a peace to you. The Bible says, those who have their eyes stayed on me, I will keep in perfect peace. There is a serenity to a person of faith. There is a rest. The Bible says, when you believe, you, you enter his rest. You enter his rest. You enter his solitude. You enter his, his, his peace. He said, these things I have written to you so that you may have peace in you. The word of God, when believed, produces peace. Great peace have they that love your law. Number three. When faith is alive in you, you have an assurance. There's, an, there's, a, there's a conviction. Hebrews 11 says faith is the conviction of things not yet seen. There's a conviction. There's an assurance. The Bible says let us draw near with a true assurance of faith. There's an assurance. You're assured of it. You're fully persuaded, Romans 4 says, that what God promised He's able to do. 
David said, some boast in chariots, some boast in, in horses, but I make my boast in the Lord. I'm assured that God is too faithful to fail. Number four, there is a confession. Real Bible faith will produce a confession of faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith as they did, they believe and therefore spoke, so we also believe and speak. When you believe, you will speak. Your mouth will move. If there's no confession, it is evidence that there is no faith. And number five, praise and thanksgiving. When there's genuine faith at work in you, you're already thanking God for the, for the results. You're all, there's a genuine heart of gratitude. Like uh, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, it says, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you have received it. You already know that you have it. It's already in your possession. It may not have manifested yet with your eyes, but you, you've seen it with your heart and you've held it. You've held it in the spirit. You know it's yours. You know it belongs to you and you begin to praise God. You thank God ahead of time. You're, be you're believing for something and there's genuine faith in you. It results in you having your hands lifted in genuine thankfulness that the answer is already here. So number two, in steps to developing faith is recognize that while every Christian has faith, not every Christian is at the same level of faith and you can move on. I've written down different levels of faith that people may have. No faith. Talked about it before. These are the unbelievers. These are worldly people who have rejected Jesus. These are people who, who have not even heard about the message of Jesus yet. They're ignorant to the message of the cross. They have no faith. Mark 4.40 says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have faith? No faith. When you have no faith, it produces fearful living. The unregenerate spirit generates, generates fear. The unredeemed spirit generates fear. They don't know what it means to not be afraid. They have no faith. Number two, there's little faith. Little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Matthew 4, 14, 31. Why did you doubt? Oh, ye of little faith. So Jesus recognized there are people who have little faith. Little faith is susceptible to great doubt. Doubt, in definition, is belief in the devil. Doubt is faith. It's just faith in the wrong thing. It's belief in the devil. Faith is belief in God. So when you have little faith, you have much doubt. But when you have much faith, you have little doubt. You have to think of your faith as like a meter. You have a meter. Two opposite ends of the spectrum. Here's the doubt spectrum. Here's the faith spectrum. And you have a little dial that indicates reality as to where your faith is. And that dial can either be on one side or the other side. Some people are running on empty. They have little faith. The good news is, is if you feel like you have little faith, you can grow your faith. Number three is great faith. Matthew 8, 5 through 10. Great faith is the product of great trials. So people who have great faith are those who once had little faith, they had a measure of faith, and they've learned to use that faith, and over time, that faith has grown into, in, into a great faith. They've tested their faith on things before, and they've developed it into great faith. You don't arrive at great faith overnight. You graduate to this level of faith by using your faith from its infancy. You don't arrive at... Lifting up 100-pound dumbbells overnight. You graduate to that over time as you go from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 100. So great faith, it, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, is the product of great trials or great fights. And so the more you engage your faith and turn loose your faith, the more you actually learn to have confidence that faith works and the more that happens, you walk into great faith. There's weak faith. Number four, Romans 4.17 says, And be not weak in faith. And be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Faith can be weakened. Faith can be weakened. You can have strong faith at one point that got weakened because of uh, some sort of trial, some sort of tragedy, some sort of... Loss of a relative or a loved one, something unexpected, can, if you leave your heart unguarded, can weaken your faith. People's influence in your life can weaken your faith. You could be someone, you can listen to this broadcast right now and your faith meter has gone to strong faith. 
And then you get around some nincompoop who starts to just vomit all kinds of doubt on you. And what happens is your dial is going to go boom until you've got nothing left, until you've been weakened in faith. There are forces that the devil desires to send your way. People under his influence that desire to weaken your faith. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 22 to Peter? Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you so that your faith would not fail. So Satan will utilize human vessels to get around you and spew all kinds of garbage in your ears to sift you as wheat, to weaken your faith. But Jesus said, I've prayed for you so that your faith may not fail. So there's weak faith. Number five, there's strong faith. Romans 4.20, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God in unbelief, but was strong in faith. Strong in faith. I started playing hockey recently again. I haven't played uh, since last year, and so I started playing again on outdoor rinks and stuff. The first night I went out, my legs were mush, mush, weak, jello mellow. I mean, I couldn't even feel them at one point. And it wasn't the cold, it was just, I didn't have the strength in my legs to actually play for an hour, and I played for an hour. Because I didn't have any more strength, I literally staggered. I staggered off the ice. Like, I literally had to, like, lift my leg on my bed that night. The Bible says Abraham staggered not at the promises of God, but was strong in faith. So because my legs were mush, I staggered. I walked differently. Matter of fact, my back hurt so much on the lower end because when you skate, you're hunched over slightly. My back hurt so much that I like I looked like, uh, what's that guy's name? The, 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 the Disney guy. The hunchback of Notre Dame for a little bit. I was in pain. I staggered. Some people stagger at the promise of God because they've not grown to be strong in faith. They're limping throughout all of life. They stagger at the promise of God. What does it mean to stagger? It means to be up and down about it. Not sure about it one day, sure about it the next day, unsure about it the next day. Number six, exceedingly growing faith said it before, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we are bound to give God thanks for you always, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. You can come to a place where your faith is like on a supernaturally accelerated growth, uh, growth phase where you're just indulging the word of God daily and you're exceedingly growing your faith. Number seven level of faith is full of faith. Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. It's funny because you have people, and I've talked about being filled with the Holy Ghost, and it's important. But why do we always talk about being full of the Holy Ghost, but we don't talk about being full of faith? It's equally as important. Because first of all, the Holy Ghost can't even do anything outside of you using your faith. The Holy Ghost in you is faith activated. The gifts of the Holy Ghost are faith activated. Everything hangs on faith. The just shall live by faith. So everything the Holy Spirit does in your life is going to be faith triggered or faith activated. Faith is what steers on the Holy Ghost to move. Hallelujah. Stephen was not just full of the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of people who are full of the Holy Ghost that don't win one soul to Jesus. Why? Because they're full of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have faith to open their mouth and tell people about Jesus. Stephen was not just full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith. If you can be filled with the Holy Spirit which means to be baptized, immersed so that you smell like him and you carry the, the nature of him, then you can be filled with faith in the same, in the same fashion. It shows you that faith is not just something you think. It's not, faith is not just in the thought life, although it will affect your thought life. Faith is a living power. It's not just proper thinking or motivational thoughts. It is living power that you can be filled with. Hallelujah. Number eight, sincere faith. The purpose of the commandment is this, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some people have faith that is not sincere. Talked about this before, they make big faith statements, but they're not sincerely there in their hearts. Romans 12 says, prophesy in proportion to your faith. Don't prophesy just anything, in proportion to your faith. Do you sincerely believe God can do that? If not, don't say it out loud. There was a guy, Lester Summerall was counseling, it was a pastor who got up on the pulpit one day and said, by next Sunday, I'm going to have a house 
to my personal name fully paid off. He didn't have a dime to his name, neither did he have the ability to get a mortgage for that. Next Sunday comes around, he has to come up before his, because he got excited, but he had to come up before his congregation and said, uh, brethren, I'm sorry, I said some things last week, I, I, did not, I do not have a house, uh, I, I don't have a house to report that I have in my possession now. He went to Lester Sarnwell the following week, he was ashamed, humiliated, and embarrassed, and said, why didn't it work? And that's where he said, Lester Sarnwell, which I coined the phrase before, he said, have you ever believed God for like anything smaller than a house before? And he said, well, no. It's the first time I've actually ever prophesied publicly. He said, maybe start off with prophesying small things. Maybe prophesy a donut before you prophesy a seven-tiered cake. Maybe start at the... Some people have insincere faith. Some people, the insincerity is not just that they, 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 they're not at the level to actually say big things like that. Some people are insincere in their faith in that it's all just showboating. It's all just to be seen by men. They're not actually faith people. There was a guy, I remember hearing the story that every time this preacher was preaching, he was talking about prosperity and, and financial stewardship and stuff. And this guy on the pulpit kept on amening every one of his statements. So he'd make a big thing like God's able to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And he started to talk about the tithe and the offering, test me now in this, give and, and see if I will not pour out the windows or open up the windows of heaven and pour you out so much so a, a blessing you won't have enough room to hold it all in. He would amen, got up on his feet, clap. But every time he would do that, this preacher said, I had, I had like a check in my spirit. I just, I, it didn't feel right. It seemed insincere. And so he went to the pastor after. And he said, I don't know why I felt like that, but that, and he was an associate pastor on staff. He said, that guy, he kept irritating me every time he hallelujah, something not right there. And the pastor, without even asking, said, yeah, I know. I've checked his giving statements for the year. He gave a total of $200 all of last year. And he, and he knows his salary because he's on staff. That's not even anywhere near a tithe. So you had this guy that was insincere in his faith. He amen, he hallelujahed, all the prosperity statements and promises. Even when, when the preacher started to talk about giving, he got up on his feet and, and shouted him down because he was preaching real good. But it irritated the preacher because he was insincere in his faith. He wasn't even a giver himself. You can have insincere faith. Number nine, unwavering faith. The Bible says in James 1, 6, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. That's a constant, steadfast Rock type of faith, not prone to ups and downs. People waver in faith when they observe the waves of life. If you're a person that's double-minded, you look at the word, but then you look at the world, you're going to waver in faith. You're going to be unstable, double-minded in all your ways. The Bible says, when Peter saw the wind boisterous, he began to sink and became afraid. He wavered because he observed the waves of the world rather than looking at the word of God. Number 10, rich faith. Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? There are people, when they speak about faith, there's a richness to their words. You wanna know why there's some people that talk on faith and their words are rich, they're loaded, they're weighty. And other people can say the exact same statements and speak and preach the exact same sermon, but it feels empty and void of power. Because one is rich in faith. So when he speaks his sermons, when he preaches his message, the words carry a certain richness to it. Their words are loaded with that same faith. They're able to make withdrawals of faith because they're so rich in faith. Many work so hard and attempt difficult things in life to secure an earthly bank account and earthly riches, but spend very little time in developing a faith bank account that is rich and loaded. When you're rich in faith, it is so much better than being rich in, in resource because resources can be taken away at any time. Paul was rich in faith. That's why he says, I know in Philippians 4, I know how to abound and I know how to be without anything. I know how to abound. I know how to use my riches when I have them and I know how to develop and move on and build up riches when I don't have anything. Acts chapter 28, he's a prisoner on, on Malta. He's got nothing to his name. By the end of the 13 or 12 verses, the Bible says the natives of the land showered him with high-level blessings and sent him on his way. Hallelujah. With gifts of honor, the Bible says. Hallelujah. So when you're rich in faith, it's actually better than being rich 
in worldly possessions because when you're rich in faith, you can actually, you have the ability to draw on God's resources and produce no matter where you're at. People that are poor in faith are constantly complaining about why things don't work, about where they're at now, about their situation. They blame others, blaming the economy, blaming other people around them, blaming their parents, blaming their loved ones, blaming their relatives, blaming their friends, blaming this, blaming their job, blaming their boss. Poor faith people. People that are poor in faith are blaming everybody else. People that are rich in faith don't care about where they're stationed. They don't care about where they're at. They don't care about what they're seeing in the natural because they carry a currency that can pull on God's resources and produce no matter where they're at. Hallelujah. Be rich in faith. Number 11, perfect faith. James 2.22, see how faith was working together with his works and by works with his faith became perfect or was made perfect. This is fully developed faith. You can actually develop your faith to the point where it is fully developed. Number 12, world overcoming faith. 1 John 5.4, whatever is born of God has overcome this world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. If faith can overcome the world, then faith in God can overcome poverty in your life. Faith in God can overcome sickness in your life. Faith in God can overcome despair and despondency and depression in your life. Faith in God can overcome any situation in your life. Faith in God can overcome the anxiety in your life. Faith in God will cause you to become an overcomer even with respect to the attacks of the devil against your life. Faith in God will empower you to become an overcomer. Faith people are overcomers. When you join the faith camp, you've joined the camp of overcomers. Faith can overcome the world, then faith can overcome anything in the world. Hallelujah. Number 13, failing faith. But I've prayed so that your faith would not fail. Faith failure is to the spirit what heart failure is to the body. When your faith fails, your spirit has died down. Just like when your heart fails, your body dies. Number 14, dead faith. And I talked about this before. Dead faith is stagnant, not lively. People who have dead faith are those who have just settled. Their faith has died concerning a specific thing. They've just settled. Uh, okay, Sarah, Sarah. Whatever happens, happens. I have learned to live with this. You have dead faith. People who settle for mediocrity have had their faith die. Hopelessness settles in concerning that thing, and they've chosen just to accept things as they are. Faith does not accept. Living, vibrant faith does not accept the devil's report or his packages. Faith learns to, rescind the, to, to return the package to sender. Faith, lively, active, vibrant faith does not accept the devil's packages. Living faith returns the package back to sender, back to hell where it belongs. The Bible says, to those who belong to the land of the living... There is hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion. There are some who have had lion faith at one point, but it's died out. They're, they're an old dead lion. The Bible says a living dog is better than a dead lion. Even someone with a little bit. Jesus said, if you have just a tiny mustard seed faith, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed from here to there and it will obey you and nothing will be impossible to you. Why? Because even though a dog is not as strong as a lion, it's still alive. And it's better than a dead lion. I prophesy in Jesus' mighty name, your, your faith shall come back to life again today. Your faith is being revitalized right now. Your faith is being reinvigorated with, with, with the force of heaven right now in Jesus' mighty name. You will not have dead faith. Your faith will no longer be stagnated. Your faith will not fail you. In Jesus' mighty name, from today, your faith is springing back to life and that excitement shall be restored. And number 15, shipwrecked faith. Holding faith and a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1.19, which some having put away concerning faith have suffered shipwrecked. They've suffered shipwreck. People who have had their faith shipwrecked are those who something terrible happened to them. They endured for a little while, but they couldn't hold off. And they've suffered shipwreck. And their faith is, 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 is idle now. Your faith, if you've been shipwrecked, if something caused you to have your boat hit a rock and you've titanicked, in Jesus' mighty name, 
You're being restored back. Back to life. Living faith. So I'll finish with this. I'm going to do this very quickly. How do you develop your faith? Number one, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. You cannot pray for more faith. You cannot fast and pray for more faith. You cannot give your way out of doubt and unbelief. Faith comes by one thing, hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Number two, faith is affected by what you see. How do you develop your faith? Be careful and mind what you see. Matthew 14, 20, when he saw the wind boisterous, he became afraid. Mind your focus. If your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is not single, it'll be filled with darkness. God sold to Jeremiah, said to Jeremiah, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see an almond tree, an almond branch. Good, you've seen well. I'm going to hasten my word to perform it. What you see will affect your faith in what you're able to believe God for. You can only believe God to the level of what you see in his word. So not only not look at the bad reports, not only turn away from... Uh, from uh, things that would generate fear, turn, turn your eyes to things that generate faith. Look into the word of God. Study this book of the law. Show yourself approved. God told Abraham, lift up your eyes and see. The land that, I've, I, that you see is the land that I'll give you. As far as you can see in this book is what you'll be able to get. And then number three, faith develops by using it. Use what you've got. Let me tell you what I read yesterday. Luke chapter, Luke chapter, what is it? Luke chapter... Luke chapter uh, 17, verse 5. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Lord, we want more faith. Help us to increase our faith. We have some, but we want more. What did Jesus say? If you have faith as the mustard seed, you can say to this mountain or this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea and it would obey you. So Jesus answers that question. Increase our faith. God, we want, to, we want more faith. Jesus we have a request, more faith. Jesus' response, use the faith you've got. Lord, the Lord said, if you have faith, because he said increase our faith, which signifies they had faith. So he says, if you have faith, as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Essentially, Jesus is saying, you have faith, now use what you've got. Use what you've got. You want to build strong natural muscles? You go to the gym. You want to build strong spiritual muscles, especially this muscle of faith? Begin to use what you've got. The Bible says in Luke 19, in 12 to 17, a parable where he delivers minas to his servants. And the Bible says the master returned to see what his servants had gained by trading. You gain by trading. In the, in the currency of faith, you gain by trading. You can't sit on your faith and expect it to increase. You gain by trading, by using it. There was a time when Dag Heuer Mills, who's a great evangelist, he was a, a medical doctor, studied, fully licensed, came into the ministry, but he knew so much about diseases and sicknesses that he had a hard time actually believing God for healing in his own crusades for a little bit. And he realized as he pulled away from that medical knowledge and all that, and he pulled towards and drew near towards the word of God and studied the gospels and all that Jesus did, he realized that he, it became easier to believe God for healing in other people's lives. He gained by trading. The more he prayed for the sick, and it, maybe it didn't happen all the time, but the more he saw people getting healed, the more his faith increased to, to deal with even the more difficult cases the less you pray for the sick, the less faith you'll have in praying for the sick and you'll never step out. The more you pray for the sick, even if it doesn't, you know, when I first got saved, I saw lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. I, I prayed for everything that moved and had sickness in it. Did everyone get healed? No. Do I know why? I don't know why. It's never on God's end. It's either me or them. It's never God. God's will is very clearly stated in scripture. He desires all to be, to, to be healed. But I didn't get discouraged and say, you know what? I'm done. Not praying for anybody anymore. I, I obviously don't have a gift of healing. There's no... I, I, gifts of healing is another thing. We're, we can talk about that on another broadcast. But the duty and responsibility to pray for the sick and believe for healing is the responsibility of every ambassador for Christ. So the more I prayed for the sick, 
Even though at the first couple of times nothing happened, I started to see things happen. And the more I started to see things happen, the more I had a desire to pray for more sick people. And the greater faith I had for the difficult cases that came my way. The first time I had someone with a blind eye open. It did something to me. I, I didn't just read this in a book now. I know God's still doing this in this day and age. Now I have greater faith to pray for blind people, deaf people, everything. When my wife and I were starting out in the ministry, it took all of our faith to believe God, to sow an offering that would generate a harvest of $5,000. Took everything in us. Took everything in us. And I remember the first time that $5,000 in one check came into our, into our possession. And we were like, this is awesome. We were, we were drizzling down. We had a, maybe 100 bucks or something in our bank account. We had no money. And then that $5,000 came in, and I can tie it to a seed that I had sown weeks before. But now, because I've used my faith over the years in believing God in the area of finances, now to believe God and sow something that would generate $5,000 is, is easy for me. Now I'm believing God for, I'm, I'm stretching myself out. I'm, I'm, I've used my faith at different levels. I've, I've seen God come through at different levels. I've come into great faith. I am now using my faith for greater things start off by believing for lighter things and then you graduate to the heavier cases hallelujah let me finish off by telling you this and i'm going to prophesy over you right now you will not have weak faith from this day onward you will be a person that carries strong faith in god you will no longer stagger at the promises of god in unbelief you will be strong in faith you will not be a wavering Christian. You will not be an up and down Christian. You will carry great faith. You will carry sincere faith. Your faith will wow God. Just like he was wowed by the centurion when he said, Wow, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Your faith shall wow God from this day onward in Jesus' mighty name. The spirit of faith is coming on you this week. As you've come into these two broadcasts and as you come the rest of the week, the spirit of faith is coming on you. You are jumping levels in faith. You are going to a high level of faith. You will become a giant of faith. You will believe God for great things in Jesus' mighty name. You will be an inspiration in the, uh, in the lives of others to believe God for greater things. You shall do exploits because of this force of faith on the inside of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're watching me right now and you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do that now. If you have, but you've gone astray, you've had your faith shipwrecked. You've had your faith die out. Satan has sifted you as wheat and your faith has died. But today, God's calling you home. He's saying, come, I'm gonna quicken that faith alive again. I want, I want you today to give your life to Jesus, to rededicate your life to him. He'll quicken your faith. Your faith will come alive again. God will resurrect your faith in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess Jesus is Lord. I come to you today. Reinvigorate my faith. Forgive me of my sin. I receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the spirit of faith. I'm no longer going backward. I'm moving forward with you. I repent of sin. Heaven is now my home. God is my father. Jesus is my Lord. And the devil is of no relation at all. I am saved. Heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to go to my website, salvationnow.ca. The first link that pops up is I just got saved. Click it, fill out that form. I want to get something to you free of charge. It's a little gift basket, or not basket, but a gift package that we have that's going to bless you. It has a Bible and some reading material. I want you to go on salvationnow.ca, the first link that pops up. I just got saved. Click it, fill it out. I want to get that to you as a way of welcoming you into the family of God. I want to help you, so let me help you. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji. Or visit us online 
www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you, and until next time.